Okay. Why don't we start at the beginning? What happened here? We were pushing mid together, and, and this guy? He said the guy was one shot. Oh, and was he one shot? No! Hey, it felt like a lot of damage. And you didn't even tell me about the guy flanking behind me. I, I, I thought you noticed him. How could I have noticed him if I was cracking the other guy? All right, all right. I, I think I understand what is happening here. You two don't know how to communicate. Being able to communicate is a very important part of playing a competitive game. Not just knowing how to do it itself, but also how to do it effectively. And if you don't have that, well, you end up with situations like this. Yeah, but how do we learn how to do it? Don't you worry. I have something that will help. Are you struggling to inform your teammates with the info they need most? Are you entering fights with your team blinder than a mole rat? Then this video is for you! Okay, I am done with that. In a team-based game, it's always important to be able to communicate with your team. Where to go? What to shoot? How not to push in when I am still healing? What the hell are you doing? Calming doesn't come easy for everybody. And knowing what to say and what not can be hard for any player, even a pro. So today, let's break down the most social factor for competitive gaming, and often the hardest part for many among us. Hi, I'm Moreover, and let's dive into the art of communication. Art of communication? Eh, that's not really a good name. Doesn't roll off the tongue, yeah. How about the art of comms? The art of... Talking? Art of socializing? The art of chit-chat. Well, regardless of what we call it, let's find out what the art of... Chattering! Word making. What this video has to say. What is communication in competitive games like? Communication, or calming, is the act of calling out information to your teammates during a live game. Everything from using voice chat to call a push, pinging an enemy, or typing in all chat to swing left and pushing right instead, all of it is comms, and how you calm is important. Primarily, most of my discussions like this focus around Apex Legends, but the topic for today can fit for any competitive team game, from Overwatch, Valorant, CSGO, Halo, COD, whatever your flavor. Knowing how to calm will only make you better at them. But how do you communicate in games in the first place? Hello? Okay, that's a bit condescending, but you get the gist. Calming is as simple as turning on your microphone, opening voice chat, and using your mouth hole to make sounds in the ears of your teammates. If you can't use mouth noises for whatever reason, then using text chat is a lesser but good alternative. Or a ping system, if the game allows. You know how to say things. Great, but I can tell the next question on your mind before you even say it. What should I say? Do not worry. I have a list of important information that you should convey to your team during a live match. Let's begin with... Enemies, items, high ground, low ground, abilities, utilities, ultimates, hero picks, isolated targets, group targets, enemy movement, your movement, anyone out of position, free picks, approaching danger, hazards, useful tools, and important positions, important targets, objective status, objective completion, failed objectives, thrown grenades, cooldowns, timers, Whoa. Rocks to use as cover. We'll just skip this Boxes part. to use as cover. Boxes to use as cover. And in fact, there is an easier way to explain all of that with one simple question. Is what you are about to say relevant to the current game? If your answer is yes, then comment. Is your Uber ready to go? Then comment. Is that battery something your team can pick up? Comment. Have you rushed B for five rounds straight and gotten demolished every single time? And know that if your team does it again, your brain will rupture into a dozen tiny mice pretending to be a human being? Yeah, you should comment. Information is everything in a competitive game, and having more than your opponent is paramount. So even if it's something as small as where you are standing or where a few shield cells are, you should still communicate that. But be careful of the pitfalls that come with this. Say you are moving across the map and find a horizon grazing in her natural habitat, and you decide you want to inform your teammates of the horizon's location. Whatever you do, do not say, horizon, over there. Bro, dude. Over there, here, there. These all call out something, sure, but 
What? Your comms have to be able to convey things to your team quickly and easily, and that includes direction. Don't sacrifice important information for the sake of speed. Calling something for the ease of it can be more misleading than not having the information at all. There are better ways to get this information across like that. You want to communicate the things that you can bring across anywhere. The positioning, the health and HP of your teammates, yourself, the enemy, and any information that you might have that is just prevalent. Just give the comms that you can and give as much information as you can that's going to help the people around you. This is Psycho. And Psycho will be helping us explain what comes next in communicating. So, you learned how to calm. You know what to calm. What do you do with it? Well, I guess I can just keep playing the game. Oh, no, God, this jet pisses me. Important information is only as good as how much you use it. And coordinating that information with your team is just as important. Which often means that you have to call a play. <gasps> I know, I know, but let's understand first what that means before you get scared. So, what does it mean to call a play? In essence, calling a play is giving a direction for your team to follow. A strategy for everybody to use in the match. And having a strategy is often more important than the information itself. If we want to rush A as a full team, we need cover to block sightlines that are bad for us. Here. Calling your brimstone to block those sightlines ahead of time means you can spend more time rushing A. Calling for your sage to block the flank right with here. her wall keeps you safe for longer, and asking your jet to hold your off angle will only make your bomb defense better. Playing as a cohesive team will always be better than playing blind to your team. Sure, you can find success alone, but in a team game, you aren't doing your best unless you're working with your team. And that sometimes calls for a leader to direct them. And yes, you can be that leader, even if it comes with some challenges. When you're a leader, you have in your head all the time, like, well, what if I mess this up? What if I mess that up, right? When you're an IGL and you're taking that step for your team and you're doing the best that you can, and you're willing to take those risks and learn, those show great leadership potential. They have to understand that if they didn't exist and they didn't do their role, well, the team wouldn't really get anywhere. So it doesn't matter your experience, really. It doesn't matter how good you think it are, how good you think you are at anything. There needs to be a leader. Whoever steps up to that should be honored and praised for doing that in the first place. And if somebody on your team has stepped up to that plate, then you as a teammate can help to support them too. Prompting. So. Your IGL, they're going to be looking at a bunch of different things. They're going to be like, you know, I'm, I'm like, A, they need to be a player. So they need to loot. They need to shoot. They need to use their abilities. Like, those are already, like, things as is. But then on top of this now, they have this extra task. The IGL's task is to properly communicate in advance or in the urgency in the moment what the goal and objective of the team is. When you notice, like, something needs to be done, like Ring is closing, or you've got resources, or you've just res your IGL, or whatever, you know, that might look like, you need to ask, you need to prompt your IGL. Prompting your IGL, what do you want to do? How do you want to do it? Help. It's the job of everybody on a team to make the right calls happen, not just the one calling it. And the more experience you get in your game of choice, the better you become at helping make those calls. And maybe one day, you two will be able to say, Post Malone, eat the, the stairway, stairway with me. me. Inform, prepare, and coordinate. That is how you communicate. Now, after watching that, do you both feel like you have a better understanding of how to communicate? Yeah, I guess I could have said something better than one shot there. That's good and it will make you both better in the long run. How about you? Don't you think you should be more open to communicating with your teammate? <sighs> Dude, come on. We barely say anything when we're playing anyways. Now, now. No, no, that's it. That's why I don't like talking. Every time I do, you get mad at me. Every time I make a mistake, I'm scared that you or some random will flame me out for it. So, no, I, I don't want to talk. <sighs> That's a more complicated problem. I was part of a musical in elementary school that everybody in my class had been preparing weeks for. I was part of the chorus, but I also had an additional role to play. 
Before one of the songs, I would sit behind the curtain with a microphone and say a few lines of narration to set the stage. That would be my first ever voiceover role, funnily enough. Leading up to the big show, I felt confident that I could do it. It was two lines, and all I had to do was say them at the right moment. I could remember them perfectly at any moment I was asked, except for one time. As I was handed the microphone, my mind had gone blank. I was behind a curtain. I could only see the teacher who handed me the microphone. But I knew who was just past that curtain. My family. My friends. Everyone I knew up until this point was standing there. And never before had I felt so terrified of knowing that. I was terrified of getting it wrong. I stammered out a few words at that moment and ran back to my place in the chorus. The show moved on. When I got to my place in the chorus, a friend of mine stood next to me and leaned towards me. He whispered, you didn't say it. All I could say back was, I know. That was nearly 15 years ago, 16 if this comes out on or after April 12th. I couldn't tell you the names of any of my classmates or the faces of any of my teachers, but that one moment I can remember vividly. For the longest time, I had no idea what that fear was. I had been so confident up until this point in my life. I mean, I even did a talent show the previous year where I did magic tricks, where every single one failed. And I stayed there and played it for laughs, and it was a great time. But that musical, in that one moment, I couldn't. It wasn't a good time. It was hard for me to understand why it was so bad for me in that time, but years later, I came across a term that finally put words into the feelings I felt in that moment. A single phrase that I think many people will know. Performance anxiety. My definition of performance anxiety is excessive activation, and that's activation in the body and the mind to a perceived threat. In the case of sports and games, however, there's no real physical danger, at least not life and death danger, but often there's a perceived threat to psychological factors like identity, like loss, and specifically the fear of the consequences of loss like embarrassment, scrutiny, negative evaluation, or conversely, the consequences of not meeting desired goals. This is Dr. Valerie Valley of the Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital in St. Petersburg, Florida and I'll let her give you the introduction. So I'm a clinical and sports psychologist. Uh, what that means is uh, I work at that intersection where mental health and really optimal performance in athletics uh, collide. Um, so my population of interest is athletes. Um, I work with um, youth elite athletes, collegiate and professional athletes um, in this really exciting space of optimizing performance and also understanding kind of what are those barriers and what is the interference with really kind of our optimum performance and really optimum satisfaction in life. Dr. Valley will be helping me explain one of the most common causes for people struggling to communicate in competitive games, performance anxiety. Performance anxiety can appear in any situation where you're performing for an audience, whether you're giving a speech for a crowd, singing a song to a friend, or even playing a competitive game with a team and the effects can be painful. This excessive activation really interferes with cognition, with motor behavior. And so this excessive anxiety is literally choking us out from accessing the known abilities, our practice abilities to perform. Um, and it's very uncomfortable. You can practice to perform at your best possible level and choke when it's most important because your fears have forced you to forget it. Strategies become meaningless when you can't process them. Key mistakes can be made at the worst possible moment. And yes, it can be hard to speak up when performance anxiety has taken hold. Online gaming spheres in particular can struggle with communication-based anxiety thanks to one specific reason. When you're playing an online game, you have no idea who you're playing with just the username and the character model that they're playing as. Otherwise, everyone you're playing with can be completely anonymous. That anonymity can be, again, um, it can go both ways. It can be something to help support and facilitate um, a player to really kind of practice skills um, in this kind of way, but it also can be a place where um, mm, uh, 
not so, like you said, toxic or not so adaptive kind of uh, <laughs> skills are being used to potentially um, uh, harass or harm or, or simply just are, aren't skillful to, to the community as far as what the culture is that maybe or what it is they want it to be as far as developing a place of fun and kind of like fair play. Dr. Valley eloquently explains something that I can only say in plain words. Online gaming is toxic. The worst of humanity can show up in those very short moments in between games, and especially so if you're a minority of any kind. It can be hard to speak up when you expect these types of responses from the online world, and especially since we've all seen them, it can make it even harder. Whether or not you're afraid of these responses or refuse to risk them at all, the result is the same. Communication is lost. Well, communication is one of those key cognitive skills um, that is getting choked out because of the excessive arousal that's going on in the body. And so if we don't know how to regulate that level of arousal, we're not going to be able to access that higher level of decision making and communication skill required. But this video, as goofy or lighthearted as it has been, is about how to improve. No matter where you are in your journey of improvement, you can struggle with performance anxiety. But you should know, there is a way past it. Yeah, that's something that really kind of starts with self-reflection. And so, and to really kind of ask oneself, um, you know, what, um, what does just stress reactivity look like for you? To really be able to pinpoint those uh, factors, both on the outside and also internally, that um, that are stressful for us, and and then to really be able to also define what is the way that we would want to optimally um, respond in these stressful or challenging situations, and by really starting there, now we can really kind of create sort of the formula to be able to build in skills to be able to practice, which is just another name for exposure. And that's how we develop stress tolerance and resilience to the challenges or the things that are stressful to us. Does your fear come from doubts of your own abilities, expectations or reactions of what your performance may be? Do you not like the sound of your own voice or maybe how others may perceive you? All of these and far more are common causes. And finding out what you personally struggle with is the first step. Once you understand where your fear, apprehension, or even just plain anxiety comes from, that's when you can start working to improve it. Dr. Valley specifically talks about activation a lot when it comes to performance anxiety. And our first step to trying to improve on it is to learn how to calm our overactivation. Breathing exercises to calm your nerves. Music you can listen to. Exercise to get your body moving. Trying to find the comfortable in the uncomfortable is one of the biggest steps you can take to overcoming performance anxiety. But that all requires putting yourself someplace uncomfortable to start with. If you're not willing to take that risk, like our friend was back there, then you're never going to be able to go past it. To grow and play at the highest level, you sometimes have to take a leap. When you are willing to communicate and put yourself out there, it shows a lot of strength and it shows a lot towards your willingness to develop. Because as I said earlier, when you start to communicate, you're going to start to get information back at some point. You might go five games where it's just toxic and you don't get much back, right? In terms of like actually learning. But you might actually get somebody out of one of those five games, out of one of those three games that does give you some information, something to think about, something you never thought before. The other thing too is that you're doing the best thing and the right thing by doing this. So know that what you're doing is trying to learn, trying to do your best and trying to do what's right. And sometimes you're gonna get people that also positively reinforce that. That's all you have to remember and just keep going and take a break. Sometimes you, it's gonna to get to you, right? Just take a break, go at it again. But the more you keep doing that, the more positive you keep at it, you will get better. Taking that leap will put you at risk of the toxicity we have been talking about here. But you are just as likely to receive positive reactions for your communication as well. From GG's to nice rounds to cheers for a victory, all of them are possible and none of them would have been if you didn't speak up. But you don't have to dive into the deep end. There's no time limit to your improvement. If you never communicate in games, you can start with things like pings or text chat. And when you feel comfortable one day, you can turn on your microphone and make your first call out. 
And from there, well, you can only go up. And trust me when I say that online gaming, as toxic as it can be, is a great way to do this. I, I think that's the biggest kind of strength of anonymity. That becomes really now that safe practice zone. Um, and so that's just really an ideal format for that skills to really be able to be, to do the exposure, which is the practice work, to be able to build that resiliency under the specific challenges that we're wanting to face. For those of us currently struggling with performance anxiety, know that you're not alone and that you are able to improve past this and become a better player for it. For those of us not struggling, it's our job to help them, encourage those who communicate, and don't judge too harshly when someone makes a mistake. Especially, make sure to call out those being toxic in an online match. It's our job to try and make a positive environment for everybody to be able to communicate, and that only makes us a better team for it. Communication is what wins games. But positive communication is what sets the stage for better games to come. Look, I'm sorry, man. I didn't realize I was hurting you when I said that stuff. Thanks. And I'll, I'll try and speak up more when we're playing, too. Yo, yo, he's one shot! Is he? Uh, uh, no, he's, uh, cracked. Blue shields. Okay, got it. Oh, oh, oh shit! Run! What? Oh, sh oh shit! Thanks for watching, and a big thank you goes out to Dr. Valerie Valley and Coach Psycho for taking part in today's video. You'll be able to see the full interviews I had with the both of them over on my Patreon, where starting at $3 a month, you get access to all current and past interviews as well as shoutouts at the end of every video. This video in particular was recommended by supporter Order Thoreau, so thanks for that. As of the making of this video, I am currently planning to attend the ALGS Split 1 playoffs over in Los Angeles. If you happen to be attending as well, feel free to come say hi. I'd be happy to meet you. And as always, if you have any suggestions for what I should cover next, let me know in the comments. Otherwise, this has been Moreover. Have a lovely day.